out. Okay. It's out. Then I saw it. I saw it catching the back. Maybe I'm wrong. Before the clay season kicked off this year, I had lots of questions on my mind. How will Yannick Sinner perform on clay? Would Djokovic finally have a strong start on clay this time and keep his number one status? Would there be a new winner in Monte Carlo like we saw with Rublev last year? And just how are we going to minimize the chaos from the terrible line calls on clay this time? Well, it looks like we got some of the answers to these questions because the clay season engine is revving up and it's better than ever. Stefano Tsitsipas is actually a beast on clay. Novak Djokovic still has a lot of work to do. Yannick Sinner is actually most vulnerable on the surface. And finally, it's time for me to get a job as a tennis umpire because I can probably do whatever I like, screw everyone up if I get pissed, and literally get away with anything. Okay, maybe not. With the first Clay Masters 1000 title of the year already in the books, it's probably way too early for me to be making predictions about the French Open. But that's exactly what I'm going to do. But in the meantime, here's everything that happened in Monte Carlo last week. Novak Djokovic is firmly and without a shadow of a doubt nowhere close to his best tennis. Although he did reach the semis in Monte Carlo for the first time since 2015, we sometimes saw him struggle with his energy levels. It wasn't all that pretty for him. I also find it weird that Novak hasn't even made a final this year, let alone won a title. Not having a title is uh, maybe comparing to the last 15 years, uh, not, not, a, not a great season at all. Now, we could attribute his loss to Di Minore at the beginning of the year to injury, but Sinner in Australia? Physical issues and Sinner brilliance. Luca Nardi in Indian Wells? I made an entire video analyzing that loss because I couldn't fully wrap my head around it. And now, another loss this time to Casper Ruud in Monte Carlo, which means that we'll have to wait until next year for the triple career Golden Masters. I don't think it's much of a priority though for him. The Joker looks a lot more tired to me, and losing to a guy like Ruud, who isn't known for putting up a fight against the very elite, shows just how vulnerable Novak is at the moment. Of course, Novak made history by reaching more Masters 1000 semifinals than anyone in history. As usual, the Serbian literally breaks records and rewrites history with almost every match he plays this year. But embroiled in a raging war against Father Time and trying to punch back at the next gen, it's just easy to see that the cracks are already forming. That being said, you best believe that the Joker isn't done winning just yet. I'd still back him to defend his Roland Garros title, but now we know Tsitsipas is making a strong case as a Roland Garros contender. Stefano Tsitsipas deserves more respect than he's been getting. He had a slow start to the season, got kicked out of the top 10, and only entered Monte Carlo as the 12th seed. But after destroying Tomas Martin Echeverri 6-1-6 love, and straight setting Alexander Zverev and Karen Hatchinov, we knew the Greek god was in his element. And for those who don't know, Tsitsipas leads his head-to-head -head against Zverev 10-5. Facing Yannick Sinner in the semi-final, Tsitsipas might have needed lady luck, a nonchalant umpire, and a physically struggling Sinner to get over the line, especially after that double fault that could have given Sinner a double break and almost a guaranteed win for the Italian. But as a wise man once said, If, 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 doesn't exist. But the truth is that the umpires were a big problem in this tournament, and we're going to be addressing all the BS that went down later in this video. Okay, back to Tsitsipas. Facing Kaspar Ruud in the final, a good number of fans actually felt like this was Ruud's best chance to bag a big title. Not on my watch, said Tsitsipas. A breadstick in the first set and clutch holds in the second gave Tsitsipas the W in the end. Both players faced eight break points each, but it was Tsitsipas who managed to save all of his break points while converting four out of his eight break points against Ruud. Tsitsipas was also out of this world at the net, winning 22 points at the front of the court while also managing to blast 24 winners most of which were off his forehand, but we were all expecting that anyway. Rude's forehand, which happens to be his strongest weapon, was no match for Tsitsipas, who delivered a barrage of forehands on Sunday. 6-1, 6-4, your final score for Tsitsipas. It's a hat-trick in Monte Carlo. A third Monte Carlo title, a third top 10 win of the week, and an 11th career title. The Greek god decided to embark on a revenge mission after seeing all the disrespect. For those who wrote him off, you might want to have a rethink and start to consider him as one of the favorites for the Roland Garros title. Crazy, right? We're still a long way away from the French Open, and a lot of things can still change, but I'm just saying. He beat two top five players last week and also dominated a top 10 player in the final, so that's quite some statement. Meanwhile, Tsitsipas is now goaded, at least in Monte Carlo. 
He's just the fifth player in the Open era to win three or more Monte Carlo titles, joining Bjorn Borg, Thomas Muster, and Ilya Nastasi, not to mention Rafa, who has 11. Also, Tsitsipas boasts the second highest win percentage in Monte Carlo at 86.9%, only behind Rafa, who sits at a pretty 92.4%. Tsitsipas's Monte Carlo win is also a subtle reminder of how good he can be, especially on clay. Two Masters 1000 titles, a French Open final, finals in Rome, Madrid, and Barcelona three times. I mean, the guy's a real threat on the surface. This guy is really branding himself as a clay court specialist. Tsitsipas is now just the third man born in 1995 or later to have 100 career wins on both hard and clay courts, after Alexander Zverev and Kasper Ruud. Talking about Kasper Ruud, hmm secures the biggest win of his career. Speaking of Kasper Ruud, I had some thoughts. Ruud had lost all 25 sets against top three players, but after denying Djokovic in the semifinal, you get the feeling that he's one step closer to a big title. Call him a perennial loser, big match choker, or whatever you like, I still very much believe that Kasper will win one of those big titles with a flourish. Although he didn't really show up in the final, especially in the first set, and his forehand might have deserted him when he needed it most, he'll be back. I didn't put on a better performance today, but uh, hopefully I can be back with another chance. For someone who's made back-to-back -back French Open finals, beat Nole on clay en route to the final in Monte Carlo, Rude is surely a dark horse for Roland Garros. But for now, he's definitely going to tell his children and grandchildren one day that he was able to beat Djokovic at least one time. Still, it doesn't help to see that Kasper Ruud is now a disastrous 0-7 in finals above the 250 level, and he'll probably be dealing with a lot of mental scar tissue at this point. Well, maybe one day in the future, he'll eventually win a big title. But that's likely not going to happen when you simply cannot capitalize on your opponent's second serve. Looking across the net at Stefanos, how did Tsitsipas manage to win more points off his second serve than with his first? At the same time, Rude managed to only win 7 out of 19 points on his second serve. The combination of both factors, his inability to capitalize on Steph's second serves, as well as his inability to shield himself from attacks on his second serves, was a major deciding factor in how the game turned out. Don't worry, Casper, Tsitsipas also won 62% of his second serve points against Sinner, whom we're going to talk about a bit later. Sinner is also an elite returner, which just goes to tell you how good Tsitsipas actually is. We could also talk about how Rude's eagerness to dictate play with his forehand sometimes left him exposed. Here's one. And here's another. Tactically, there were a few other factors that played out in the match. When Rude stood deep behind the baseline on the return, Tsitsipas punished him with some clinical serve and volleying, and when he came forward in a bid to rush Tsitsipas on that tactic, his backhand return was a lot weaker, and Tsitsipas capitalized on it almost every time. I might not be able to talk about everything that went down in that final, but one of the biggest talking points of the week had to do with Holger Runa. Oh, and you might have probably noticed that we rebranded. We're going to be bringing you content directly from the tours and hearing from the players themselves that we talk about on the recaps right here on the channel. I can't wait to share more with all of you. Now out of the top 10, after failing to defend his finalist points from last year, Runa might want to take some solace in his performance, seeing how well he managed to play after being at the receiving end of what many fans still think was an absolute joke of scheduling. Holger had to play Dimitrov less than two hours after completing the rest of his match against Nagal, and then had to play Sinner the following afternoon. Talk about an exhausting schedule of tennis. And then, in his match against Sinner, what does he get? Code violation for unsportsmanlike conduct for this? And he wants to give a bit back. Congratulations, and sportsman like conduct, warning, Mr. In the warning for this, I, don't, I didn't say the bad words to them. It's not a question of words, it's a question of sign, everybody understood. That was a crazy call. Novak Djokovic literally conducted an orchestra earlier in the tournament, and he'll probably be thanking his stars that he didn't do that in front of that particular umpire. In a match where Runa had to take on the crowd, the umpire, supervisor, not to mention a red-hot Yannick Sinner, I couldn't help but feel for the kid this time. Runa, more than anyone else, got the rough end of the stick. Barely any rest in between his matches, and all sorts of wrong calls from umpires. And to add insult to injury, this tweet from the ATP Tour X account. I don't think it's fair for fans to call Runa salty, even if his attitude usually isn't the best. But after everything that he had to go through in Monte Carlo, I clearly understand his frustration. And Runa might be out of the top 10 for a little while, seeing that he also has to defend 250 points from his Munich title win last year. 
But the good news is that Runa is playing way more aggressively than he did last year, and he's been playing amazingly well under pressure with a 12-2 tiebreak record this year. So yeah, we might want to keep an eye on him. Looking across the net to the man who beat Runa, Yannick Sinner was dealt a heavy hand, or should we say he got robbed after he saw a chance to go up a double break slip out of his hands because of yet another terrible call. Sinner ended up fading out and losing the match, but the truth is that single wrong call could have been the difference between Sinner lifting the title and Tsitsipas doing the same. Sinner eventually faded out of the match as he had to deal with physical issues late on. And this begs the question, with Clay being the most physically demanding surface and with Sinner already showing signs of wear and tear, just how well do you see him performing for the rest of the clay season? If you asked me, I'd say the rest of the top players have the best chance of defeating him right here on clay. It doesn't mean that they will, but they are more likely to. Sinner accepted the umpire's mistakes graciously and had this to say. Everyone can make mistakes, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, you know, also I can make mistakes. But we're not done with this whole umpiring debacle just yet. Yes, I know many fans wanted more drama in tennis, but I doubt this is what they meant by that. Many fans on social media feel that umpires need to be investigated and fines also introduced for making wrong calls, but I'm not sure how that works. If you do, please feel free to share. But personally, I feel umpires should be held more accountable for their mistakes because these errors are becoming more and more frequent. Remember the Nuno Borges versus Garan drama that happened recently. Earlier in the week, umpire Mohamed Layani was given the impossible task of trying to calm down a furious Daniil Medvedev after yet another wrong call in his match against Gael Monfils. As you would expect, it didn't end well. It's out! Okay. It's out! Then I saw it, I saw it catching uh, the back. Maybe I'm wrong. Then, okay. I can't even apologize. Yeah, yeah. I lost a freaking game. It's a freaking sport, man. Why was Daniil mad? Apparently, the line judges decided to take a nap in the second set, and it led to this. This one, here, look. For me, it's good there. Here we go again. Oh, no. Shout at him. Please don't shout at him. He can make a mistake as well. Everybody this can. Yes, 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 yes. As you would expect, we saw all kinds of reactions on social media. And true to form, Medvedev, after getting the win in the end, signed this on the camera. How is this clay season going to turn out for Medvedev this time? Anyone? With the unilateral introduction of electronic line calling everywhere coming next year, hopefully we won't get to see as many wrong calls from umpires, and we can only hope for a cleaner game with fewer mistakes because it just wasn't pretty to watch. But let's not also forget that Hawkeye is not going to be perfect on clay. There's going to be some margin for error, but obviously it will be a massive step up from where we're at now. The tournament in Monte Carlo was one hell of a week, but there are still so many other noteworthy events that happened. For one, there were lessons on the secrets of longevity from the oldest number one ranked player in singles and the oldest number one in doubles. Players who have like 80 years between them. We were just saying that yeah, we're uh, combined 80, combined 80 years old. Yeah. Yannick Sinner maintained his streak of making it to the semifinals or better of every tournament he has played in the last six months. The only exception is the Paris Masters 1000, which he pulled out after the first round due to fatigue. He also showed that he has no problems adjusting to clay, as he's now made the semis of both legs of the Sunshine Double and Monte Carlo in the last two years. Also, 2016 Monte Carlo finalist Gael Monfils reminded everyone that he still has some magic left in him after his comeback victory against Alexander Vukic. <laughs> Carlos Alcaraz ended up withdrawing from the tournament and was replaced by lucky loser Lorenzo Sinego. He also wouldn't be in Barcelona as he continues to recover from an injury in his right arm. Which kinda sucks because Carlitos was just finding his best tennis again. Now, that's not gonna happen with a forearm that's taped like this. It's also crazy to see that Carlos is yet to win a single match at Monte Carlo, a fact that is equally as crazy as it is depressing. He's just not vibing with the tournament. Lucky loser Lorenzo Sonego, who replaced Alcaraz in Monte Carlo, defeated the one and only Felix Auger Aliassime, thanks to these donations from Felix right here. But that's actually half of the story because Sonego was a different animal in their round of 32 clash. Don't worry Felix fans, better days ahead. And for Andre Rublev, well, I don't know what to say. Before the tournament, he had an impressive 13-4 record in Monte Carlo dating back to 2018, but after seeing title defense hopes vanish into thin air against Alexei Papyrin, it's probably time to go back to the drawing board for Andre, because he really hasn't been the same since that Dubai meltdown and take a close look at how he exploded here again after seeing the first set slip away from him. Oh, that's exceptional. 
Guys, what do you think is the way out for Rublev? It seems like he just can't get out of his own head, and he's definitely not doing himself any favors at this point. With many of you guys requesting a deep dive on him, I'll be sure to put that in the back of my mind. But that match also reminded us that the big serving Papyrin is no slouch on clay. He was 14-5 and five on the surface last year, and also won the title in Umag. So yeah, he's actually a decent player on clay. Oh. Let's also not forget that Ben Shelton is now the new American number one after Taylor Fritz's early loss in Monte Carlo. I told you guys in a recent video that we made about him that he's the real deal. Well, look where we're at now. It only gets better from here. Last week in Monte Carlo was stacked and we saw plenty of action, but it only gets better from here. You can keep up with all the action by smashing that subscribe button, and if you missed last week's videos, don't sweat it. I have them showing on the screen right here.